Okay, so this is a question and answer session and discussion session on the measure fee material that I handed out for you to look at. And let's find out whether people have got any questions for me on this material. Hi there. There's a, a, um, you have to take the functional analysis one, not the topics and analysis. Otherwise, I'll get very confused in the center. So has anyone come up with some questions about the measure theory section? Which one? This is the page three of of the of chapter one. Page three, chapter two, section two, class of the sets. I, whether they're chapters or sections, I don't care. Um, so page three of class of the sets. Which one do you want? Example three. So this example three at the top of page three of the section. Okay. So this is example three at the top of page three of classes of sets. And the collection under consideration is the following. F is equal to those subsets of R such that A is countable or R take away A is countable. And the task is to show it's a sigma algebra. On R, of course. Noting countable includes finite sets, and it also includes the empty set. The empty set has got zero elements, so it counts as a finite set. So... So countable countable sets may be empty, finite, or countably infinite. So what do we have to check? to show that F is a sigma algebra. Well, I'll give you the, the most efficient set of way, uh, things you can check. Uh, the most efficient method uh, set of axioms to check it's not perhaps exactly the same as the other version in the notes. You should check, first of all, that the empty set is in F. Secondly, that if A is in F, then A complement, which is R take away A, is also in F. And then you should check countable unions. So if A n are sets in F, then the union should be in F as well. If you check those three, you can get the rest of the conditions for a sigma algebra from that. For example, uh, 
then x is equal to the complement of the empty set. Um, that's r, of course, is equal to x. Is equal to empty. Um, x is r in this setting. So, um, and since the empty set is, will be in, that will be in F as well, um, which you could, of course, check trivially anyway. But the point is that if you're checking, uh, this is an efficient way of doing it, and you can get to the things like intersections and so on using De Morgan's rules and unions. So, it's enough to check these uh, and the rest uses De Morgan's rules. Oh. One thing. Suppose you've checked, suppose you've shown that you can take countably infinite unions like this and stay in F. Um, of course, one of the things you're supposed to check is that you can take finite unions and stay in F. So, if you know that you can do countable unions like this, how do you know that you can also do finite unions too? Yeah, you can set most of them to be the empty set, once you know the empty set's in, or you could repeat one set infinitely often. Um, in any case, if you know that you can do countably infinite unions, the finite unions follows from the infinite unions. So I'll leave it to you to check that that's a, a good set of three things to check um, and that that would be enough. Let's check those three things for this specific example. So we're dealing with... Well, let's just pull back the definition. Oh, I can't really. OK. Um, you're in F if you're countable or your complement is countable. Well, the empty set counts. So the empty set is in because the empty set is countable. So this is OK because the empty set is countable. And this one, well, the set was if A is countable or A complement is countable. And all that A com taking complement does is swap A and A complement round. So this is um, A complement, complement equals A. So, the definition is symmetrical in A and A complement. So, if A is countable, then the complement of A complement is countable. And if A complement is countable, then A complement is countable. Um, and conversely. So you can see that, uh, that A is in F if and only if A complement is in F. So that does B. So we just have to check C. So A and B are easy for Rf, which is A contained in R, such that A is countable or A complement is countable. So we just have to check C. Let An n equals 1 to infinity, b sets in f. And we must show
that the union of the ANs is in F as well. Can anyone think of some special cases that might help here? I mean, there are various possibilities. For each of the ANs, AN is in F, so either AN is countable or AN complement is countable. So we might be able to eliminate something as an easy first case and then reduce to, to another case. Anything that we might be able to eliminate? Notice that this set is at least as big as any of the sets AN are. So the complement of this union is a subset of any of the other complements. The complement of the union is actually equal to the intersection of the other complements. So what might be a, a particular case that, that is easy? Okay, so, uh, so you could look at some special cases of sets, but I'm, I'm gonna, I want to keep the ANs general for the moment. Okay, I want to keep the ANs general, but the my, I want to consider the cases. You know, for each AN, there's case one, case two, AN is countable or AN complement is countable. So it looks like you've got uh, two to the infinity possible cases to consider, but it may be that we could eliminate one major case straight away and then only have one other case to check. All the so if all the complements were finite, um, well, that would be a special case to check. But I think that that's actually too strong an assumption. We can, we can assume something much weaker than that and still get something easily. Okay, so, so for example, suppose at least one of them has got a countable complement. Okay. Suppose there exists a natural number n with an complement countable. But then the complement of the union is a subset of an complement, so it will be countable as well. So in that case, you're in F. So what's the only other possibility? If any of the complements are countable, you're home. But for each of the sets, either the set is countable or the complement is countable. So what's the remaining case? So we can say otherwise... A n complement is uncountable for all natural numbers n, and so what's your conclusion from the information we have so far? Because these sets are supposed to be in F, they must all be countable. Then we can go back to the other kind of N. What could you tell me about the union of the ANs? That's right. It, it, it's a countable union of countable sets, so it's countable.
So the union is in F in this case as well. And that does it. Any uh, questions about that proof? I think the key thing in that proof is to realize that knowing that just one set has got a countable complement already gets you home. Now, if you realize how strong that assumption is, then you realize uh, uh, the rest is easy. So that, that's the idea for that one. OK. Any more questions that people have on the measure very stuff? Yes? Page four of this section? Page four, yes. Yes? The last line's about the Cantor set. Yeah. That's right. The Cantor set. Okay, the Cantor set's a very interesting set. So this is um, on page four of classes of sets. This is the Cantor set. And um, although the picture's not to scale really in the, in the notes, so x naught, you start with a closed unit interval. Let's make it look like a proper closed unit interval. x1, you delete the middle thirds. So I'll do something like this. I may still not be exactly to scale, but uh, we'll go naught up to a third, two thirds up to one, and this is x1. x2, you go up to, from naught up to a ninth, and you miss out a ninth, two ninths, and you go up from two ninths up to three ninths, which is a third. And again, here we start at two thirds, which is six ninths. You go up to seven ninths. You miss out the stuff between seven ninths and eight ninths. And then you go from eight ninths up to one inclusive. That's x2, and so on. So Xn is a union of how many intervals make up Xn? Well, how many intervals have we got? We've got, we start with one in X0, we've got two intervals make up X1, we have four intervals make up X2. So what's our formula for how many intervals making up xn? Two to the power of n. Two to the power of n closed intervals, disjoint of course. Uh, each interval having length Um, 3 to the minus n. Each time you throw away a third of the total length because you're deleting the middle thirds of the intervals. Now, the Cantor set C is the intersection of them all.
Now, first of all, why should that be non-empty? Various different reasons. What sort of a set is Xn? What could you tell me about Xn, topologically? Well, it is formed from the disjoint intervals. Yeah. So, who could tell me something topological about the sets Xn to start with? Closed. They're closed, yeah. Anything else? Yeah, they're nested. It's good. So let's let's put down some of these comments. The, the Xn are closed. They're nested. So that X1 contains X2 contains and so on. Um, can anyone tell me some slightly stronger topological properties of these Xn's? They're not just closed. They're closed and closed and bounded, right? And that makes them compact. compact. Exactly. So in fact, they're closed and bounded. So the XNs are compact. They're obviously non empty. <laughs> Do these uh, sets have the finite intersection property? What is the finite intersection property? Can everyone remind me what the finite intersection property is? Definition of finite intersection property. Okay. So, suppose you intersect finitely many of these x's, what do you get? Sorry, I guess. Non empty set. Yes, because they're nested. So, if you intersect finitely many, you just get the smallest one in your list which is non-empty. Um, so they're nested. So they have the finite intersection property. FIP, finite intersection property. Um, and now you can do a compactness argument to say that the intersection must be non-empty. But of course, there's other reasons. So you can use compactness to see that the intersection of the Xn is non-empty. But actually, you can do better than that. Because in fact, if you look at the endpoints of those closed intervals, they stay in forever. As you go, you keep generating new endpoints of closed intervals, and they never leave the sets. So you can show that every endpoint of a closed interval that you spot will be in the final set. But the interesting thing is there's only countably many of those, and the Cantor set is uncountable. So, in fact, all the endpoints of the closed intervals appearing in the construction are in the candle set C. They never leave. But there's only count to be many of those. There's a finite number for each end. So if you look at those endpoints, you might think those are the points of the Cantor set. 
but actually there's only count to be many of them. You can prove they're dense in the Cantor set, but their closure is actually has to be uncountable because you can prove their closure has no isolated points. Um, call this set of endpoints um, S, then you can show that S is dense in C and that C has no isolated points. Because if you take any point that's in C, you can find a sequence of endpoints in C tending to it. So uh, not equal to the point itself. So there are no points in, in the Cantor set that are isolated. All you have to do is track down which intervals were you in, then use endpoints of the intervals you were in at each stage, and those sequences of points converge to you. And you always get two choices at each stage as well. So, uh, so there's, plenty of, uh, there's lots of different ways to do it. What can you tell me about a complete metric space which has no isolated points? subset of the real line. It's a subset of the real line, so just use the usual metric. It's a, it's a closed subset of the real line, so put the usual metric, and that makes it complete. Closed subset of R, so is complete with the usual metric. I've just explained briefly orally, why C has no isolated points, what can you tell me about a non-empty complete metric space with no isolated points? The result from way back in the bare category theorem topological spaces section at the beginning, we said something about countable complete metric spaces. What happens if you have a, a complete metric space with countably many points? Okay, it's a while back. The result was that you have to have isolated points. A non-empty, and a non-empty, countably infinite, complete metric space has to have infinitely many isolated points. But C doesn't have any isolated points, and it's a complete metric space, and it's non-empty, so it must be uncountable. So that's the result from earlier. Every non-empty countable complete metric space has at least one isolated point. This includes the case of the metric space that has just one point. Okay, are people happy with what I said, or vaguely happy with what I said so far? Now, there's still a bit left there about base-free expansions. Do people know about base-free expansions? Well, this is a sort of extension, okay, but uh, um, you know about decimal and binary, presumably. Okay, decimal expansions... Decimal expansions, 0 0.A1, A2, A3, and so on, means 
a1 over 10 plus a2 over 10 squared plus a3 over 10 cubed and so on. Binary expansions, you just use base, so base 2, that's base 2, 0.A1, A2, A3, and I put a little sub 2 here to mean it's base 2, means A1 over 2 plus A2 over 2 squared plus A3 over 2 cubed and so on. Of course, here the A n would just be 0 or 1. Notice here the, the A n are 0, 1, 2, or 9. Decimal digits. Here you have binary digits. And then base 3 is in between. So 0.A1, A2, A3, and so on. Base 3 means A1 over 3 plus A2 over 3 squared plus and so on. And here... A, N, R, naught, one, or two. And that's a base three expansion. And these are all perfectly good ways of defining numbers between naught and one. Now, it turns out that the Cantor set you should just forget about the digit 1 and use digits 0 or 2. And that way, of course, you miss out the first third, and then you miss out in the next decimal place, you get rid of a third of what's left, and then in the next decimal place, you get rid of a third of what's left. So throwing away anything with a digit 1 in plays the role of deleting middle thirds. And when you do it in the first decimal place, that's at the top level. When you do it in the second decimal place, that, that's at the next level down, where you delete the next lot of middle thirds, and in the third decimal place, you get rid of anything which are the one there. However, of course, you are allowed things like 0.222 recurring base 3. Well, what's 0.999 recurring base 10? That's 1. So what do you think 0.222 recurring is base 3? That's 1, OK? That's good. So you can get some 1s. You're allowed to use any expansion involving noughts and 2s. So you can get the number 1 in, which is good, because 1 is supposed to be in the Cantor set. And uh, 0.0222 recurring base 3 is equal to 0.1 base 3 is equal to 3rd. That's good. A third is supposed to be in the Cantor set. It's one of the endpoints of one of the intervals. So you wouldn't get it by writing it as 0.1. You'd get it by writing it as 0.022 recurring and so on. Does that make a bit of sense as to how the Cantor set works with base three expansions? I've got some questions for you, unless you've got some more questions for me. Yes, you have more? Yes? So we're on page five. first page of classes of sets or of the, oh, the first section page 5 of the first section
Uh, no, hold on. There isn't a page five of the first section. Okay, I'm confused. The first page of the first section. Yes. Okay. Yes. The supremum of the empty set is minus infinity. Yes. Okay. So, so this is the claim that the supremum of the empty set is minus infinity. So, let's have a look at what an upper bound for a set is. Let E be a subset of um, R bar and let A be an R bar, then A is an upper bound for E, if for all X in E, we have A is less than, uh, it, sorry, for all X in E, we have X less than to A. This is the definition of upper bound, especially if I write bound a bit better than that. This is um, section one, page one. And so, my question is, is minus infinity an upper bound for the empty set? Okay, so you have to ask. That's right. That's right. So in fact, Every A in R bar is an upper bound for the empty set because the empty set has no elements. It's vacuous. A vacuous condition, something, if you ask anything where you say for all X in the empty set, such a statement is always true. Um, For all x in the empty set, we have x less than equal to a. That's automatically true because there's nothing in the empty set. The supremum is the least upper bound. And so it's minus infinity. The least element of R bar. It's a bit of a silly special case, but sometimes it saves you from, uh, from having to treat the empty set as a special case, um, knowing that you don't have to check that a set's not empty before you can define a supremum or an infimum. Um, it's just unfortunate that the supremum is less than the infimum for this set. It's the only set where that happens. So similarly, the infimum of the empty set is the greatest lower bound And that's plus infinity. Because everything is a lower bound. So it's just a shame that the supremum is less than the infimum for this set. But, well, usually we'll work with non-empty sets and you won't have that problem. Any other questions? What I wanted to think about is, which Borel sets do you know about? Mm -hmm. 
I'm not saying list all Borel sets, because that's much too complicated. But I thought it would be worth just a quick discussion of which Borel sets we know. OK, so what, what do you have? So we, first of all, the definition of the Borel sets guarantees that the open sets are, are Borel sets. Open sets are Borel sets. So I think you said closed. So taking complements, you get the closed sets. We're working in R, of course. Um, G delta sets we talked about once. That's countable intersections. That's intersections of sequences of open sets. Well, an intersection of a sequence of Borel sets is still a Borel set because it's a sigma algebra. So these are definitely Borel sets as well. F sigma sets, that's countable unions of closed sets. Arborel sets. What about some concrete sets that we've met that we know to be Borel sets? Um, who can mention some interesting sets that we know about? which are definitely Borel sets, for maybe some of the reasons above. Cantor set? Is a Cantor set a Borel set? Yes. Because? For, give me the easy reason. Don't think of a complicated reason. Why is a Cantor set a Borel set? Because it's closed. That's a Cantor set. So C is, uh, here's our notation for the Borel set, a curly B of some sort. What about single point sets? They're closed. So for all A and R, that set A is also a Borel set. That's a single point set, a set with just one point in. What about Q, rational numbers? Countable, so it's a countable union of points. Um, when you enumerate. That's Q1, Q2. Um, and so that's in B, because it's a union of a sequence of things in B. And you can't leave the Borel sets by taking countable unions. I think I'll leave it to you to think of some more examples. It's quite hard to find a set that isn't a Borel set, of course, but that's 
was discussed in the, the non-measurable set section. Um, you don't have to do it that way. There are, there are other ways. But, uh, but that shows that you don't quite get everything. But, that's, uh, but finding some that you definitely know are Borel sets has its own interest. Okay, I think uh, we should stop there. And we'll have another question and answer session when we come back. So have a good holiday.